Well, I want to welcome all of you to this Skull World Forum session um, entitled Shifting Money and Control to Local Communities for Climate Action. Um, this event is being recorded and will be posted later on YouTube. <clears throat> um, there is a required Skull disclaimer, which is this session is part of Skull World Forum's Ecosystem Day and is hosted by Tech Matters with curation assistance from eco agriculture partners. Now, eco agriculture partners is the convener of a major initiative called 1000 Landscapes for 1 Billion People, which aims to bring tools, knowledge, and funding to 1,000 landscapes, 1,000 places around the world. Uh, along with EcoAg and Tech Matters, the other core partners in 1,000 Landscapes are the Rainforest Alliance, Conservation International, UNDP, the Landscape Finance Lab, formerly at WWF, and Common Land, a major Dutch NGO. And you'll hear a little bit more about a thousand landscapes and our work from Sarah, who's the, who's the chair. Um, and our agenda today will include introductory remarks from, from our different speakers uh, discussing how they found ways to channel funding uh, to local communities, to local landscapes. Um, each of our speakers will have five to, ten, uh, five to seven minutes each to kind of touch on this topic for opening remarks. And then about halfway through our 90 minute session, we'll split into small groups for you to meet each other. And I know that Skoll attendees love to meet each other and, and find out more about each other. And also talk about how you've seen ways that we've been able to channel funding, especially climate funding uh, to local communities in ways that actually make sense to those local communities that where they actually have agency and engagement in that funding. So in terms of the technology instructions, um, you know, we're very excited about uh, you guys engaging in chat. Um, we have some uh, team members here from, from Tech Matters and Eco Agriculture Partners who will be posting links to the bios of the staff, but answering questions. Um, and that dynamic will go on, I think, throughout the session. Because chat vanishes during small group sessions, um, we will share a Google Doc where each group can, can add their notes. And that will be some, that'll be a record that we actually can keep. And, and the Speakers can also look at those notes as we as we enter the final section where we're uh, going to be kind of addressing whatever we can. I know this is this is uh, going to be an interesting dynamic. It's always fun to experiment with how this how this actually works. Um, uh, Joan Malaya from Tech Matters is your tech support assistant. So if you run into some difficulties with the Zoom meeting technology, just go ahead and and direct message Joan and uh, Shannon um, from from Eco Agriculture partners uh, will also be collecting your emails if you want to be added to the Thousand Landscapes mailing list. So with that, um, I'm going to shift to uh, very brief introductions of each of our speakers. So first, Sarah, internationally recognized leader in the field of integrated landscape management, having founded and led eco agriculture partners in the United States now for over 20 years, will be our opening speaker. Pauline is an expert in innovative financing mechanisms, especially leveraging private and community investment alongside public funding, and is the executive director of Ecotrust in Uganda. Krishma is an expert in bringing together science, policy, and finance to design people-centric solutions for restoring degraded lands, and is a senior policy analyst with the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, ATRI, in India. And Mao is an expert in green growth, water, and climate change issues, and is the co-founder and executive director of the African Center for a Green Economy based in South Africa. And I'm Jim Furterman, your moderator and co-host. I'm a serial tech entrepreneur with experience in creating nonprofit software companies that focuses on addressing social needs. Uh, I'm the founder of Tech Matters, as well as Benetech, a Skoll Award winner. So with that, I would love to turn it over to Sarah, uh, for her opening remarks. Thanks so much, Jim. And it's really great to have all of you here with us today. And it uh, would be nice to be at Skoll in person, but this is a, this is a great uh, backup possibility for all of us. Um, the Skoll World Forum has actually discussed the theme of inclusive finance for many years, um, especially for farmers, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, farmer cooperatives, et cetera. Our event today is gonna focus on a, a somewhat different dimension of this, which is um, financing challenge and solutions for inclusive locally driven investment at the scale of whole landscapes or territories. This challenge has come to the fore with the commitment of major new flows of national and international funding, 
public, private, and philanthropic for investments in land to meet the critical goals of climate, biodiversity, food security, water, health, and livelihoods. Uh, last year launched the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. Let me just tell you some of the numbers that are sort of coming up with these big flows of money. The EU has committed $100 billion a year to 2025 to support climate work. The Global Forest Finance Pledge is, is for $12 billion. Uh, $100 billion is being mobilized for African land restoration, uh, nearly $2 billion for indigenous peoples. In the philanthropic space, the Bezos Earth Fund has committed $10 billion and Protecting the Planet Challenge, a coalition of philanthropic organizations, $5 billion. And in the private sector, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero has committed $130 trillion of investment uh, for climate by 2050. Not clear what percentage of that is for land, but it's it's, it was there, it was evident in, in Glasgow. And the voluntary carbon market actually reached a billion dollars last year, which is not so high, but it's a, certainly a major milestone. And while I'm very excited about the fact that there's finally a, a lot of interest from, from these different sectors in supporting um, landscape regeneration in ways that support climate change, mitigation and adaptation, um, it's really questionable how those funds are going to get to the ground, to the farmers and communities and forest managers that are actually the ones that are that are managing our, our lands and forests and, and, and resources. Um, indeed, every landscape, if you take a look at the picture I put up here, every landscape has a multitude of land users and managers, and most of them are operating at small scale. Um, their efforts need to fit together within the landscape to achieve the sustainable development goals in each landscape. Let's consider, for example, a landscape where local people have prioritized restoring year-round flow of water from a degraded river system. This is so common around the world. To sustain food, people, and wildlife, and to adapt as well as combat climate change. To, to achieve this, numerous actors across the landscape will need to revegetate their land. Farmers, herders, conservation area managers, food processing, mining, and energy companies, um, towns and villages. The effective functioning of the whole watershed and the associated bio biological corridors and efforts for climate change adaptation and mitigation green market development require that these investments happen at scale in the right places in the landscape for ecological reasons and with some degree of coordination to achieve synergies and avoid trade-offs and conflicts among them. But that means that each of these is a separate project or business investment. Because of that, it means that local landscape stakeholders do need to work together to design a spatially specific landscape action plan that reflects their long-term landscape objectives. They need to translate that into landscape investment plans that will have dozens or hundreds of investment ready, restoration positive projects and businesses. Financing strategies must be developed to support these investments so that the minimum coordination and regenerative impacts at scale can be achieved. This means there needs to be a platform or partnership at the landscape level for the long term as groups pursue development, pursue environmental conservation, pursue climate goals, and um, over the next couple of decades, these are not short term projects, they're long term partnerships. However, current financing, even the more inclusive types that have been championed and pursued in the school community make this difficult. There's still mostly short-term, project-based, sector or land user specific, and conceived and implemented in isolation from other activities in the landscape. Local stakeholders have limited knowledge about financial flows happening around them and even less control over them. Governments, private sectors, and philanthropies rarely work in tandem, particularly across sectors. Financial institutions specialized in different financial instruments don't work together, don't even know what one another are doing. Most major new flows of capital, as I was describing the examples before, but it's equally true of national 
programs, public, private, and philanthropic. Um, for climate, agriculture, biodiversity, water, infrastructure are planned externally. It's in London or it's in Nairobi uh, and dispersed to large scale established actors with minimal local input into their design or deployment. It's hard to distribute funds to local farmers, cooperatives, forest communities, and so small and medium sized enterprises. Thus, we need to develop a new system of inclusive integrated landscape finance, new institutions, new models. This is a major objective of the 1000 Landscapes for 1 Billion People initiative. Caroline, if you'll put up the other slide, such a system will need to have at least five uh, key features. First of all, landscape-wide investment planning that reflects local people's priority. And that means integrating economic development, environment and climate, and human well-being within the strategy. Secondly, we need to see coordination of project investments to achieve landscape scale impacts. We need to see coordination of public, private, and civic finance. Fourthly, we need financial mechanisms, a new generation of them, that can deploy large pools of capital to numerous small scale land and resource managers on terms that make sense to them. These are new ideas like landscape investment funds, uh, landscape grant funds, landscape banks um, that have a strong role for local governance. And finally, we need accessible information and data that can support such locally led landscape finance that's available for local people. Our colleagues, uh, Pauline Karishman Mao are now going to illustrate some of the exciting innovations that are emerging around the world as we begin to form this new inclusive integrated landscape finance system. Um, and we'll be others around, I hope, will be sharing their experiences as well. We look forward to learning more from you uh, and your ideas and experiences to bring together into this global radical collaboration of 1000 Landscapes. Thanks very much, Jim. Thanks, Sue. And now on to Pauline. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that uh, brilliant introduction, Sarah. It makes my, my life a lot easier. And I think I'm just going to go straight to taking you to what these landscapes look like, if you could um, share that slide. Um, many times the decisions are made that where Sarah is, is, is talking about, they really have no idea what these landscapes look like. And this is a, and, and uh, being able to deliver money to these landscapes in a manner that empowers the local actors, the local land managers to be able to, to make the decisions that suit the local priorities and benefits. It requires a lot of creativity and innovation. And this is a landscape in uh, Uganda, in Western Uganda. Uh, 30 years ago, and, 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 and this was almost one block of connected forest, but it has been uh, fragmented over the years, yet it's a very important wildlife corridor. So partners, um, including civil society organizations, uh, local government, uh, national government agencies, and the local communities sat together and came up with a plan on how they would like the landscape to be. They came up with an overall strategy of making this a wildlife corridor. But then in this wildlife corridor, it was understood that there are many interests in the land. There are supply chains that depend on this landscape. It's a water catchment. It's a wildlife corridor. It's rich in biodiversity, but it is also, it needed to build its resilience to climate change, but also it is, a, a very good uh, mitigator of climate change. So a, a, a system was set up whereby uh, incentive models were created that support landscape restoration as a business. And this is based on turning all these management objectives into uh, value preposition for the different actors. And then the different actors, each one designs a land use plan to be able to contribute to this general vision. Now, when that happens, we as Ecotrust, we quantify the environmental services that are going to come out of um, 
each and every one of these actions in the action plans. Then we commoditize those environmental services, sell them on the voluntary carbon market using the Plan Vivo standard, and then use that as the investment capital to be able to enable those investments. Now, the approach that we use is, made, is blended financing because we, 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 we see that there is a way you can deploy public sector financing to be able to trigger those other income streams, to be able to trigger income streams from the carbon market, but also to be able to trigger income streams from the sale of the products that come from those um, the, the, the land use activities like growing trees for timber, growing trees for fuel wood, growing trees for, for fruit production, honey, and so on and so forth. But so what, what, what is happening is that the, the, the financing model is targeting to change the investment horizon. When you look at this landscape, the large green blocks are the protected areas which are blocks of forest. But in between, you need the connectivity in between the large forest blocks. But the connecting pieces of land are owned by smallholder farmers. So you need to give them a livelihood strategy that is aligned to the objective of landscape restoration, but which also makes economic sense to them. And then the way we, when we get the funding from the market, from the carbon market, the way we deliver it to these farmers we pay it through the circles, the savings schemes. So then every farmer gets to open an account with those uh, village banks. And then the payments also create a credit history for those farmers so that they are able to access loan financing from those village banks. And they also use the payment for environmental services um, agreements as collateral for those loans. And then they use the subsequent payments um, to offset, offset the loans. Next. So what, what, what this has turned out to into is um, we've been able to create, we've been able to create an endowment fund using those uh, carbon credits. So the public financing, even though it was not intended for creating uh, an endowment fund, the way we deployed it to mobilize environmental services and the sale of those environmental services has enabled us to create an endowment fund for the organization. And without, through this um, approach, we've been able to work with 15,000 households. We've been able to get uh, emission reduction certificates of 2.2 million. We've been able to raise more than 10 million US dollars as foreign direct investment for, farm, for smallholder led forestry. We've created private reserves. We've created community reserves. We have improved livelihoods. Each and every household that we work with, we consider it an economic unit that has a management plan as well as a business plan. So with this innovation, we are able to deliver on the three objectives of biodiversity conservation, climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as uh, livelihood uh, improvement. Thank you very much. That's that's great. Well, thank you very much. And now we'll turn to Krishna. Thanks a lot, Trim. And I'm so delighted to be here today. And uh, th that was a great presentation, Pauline. Uh, and uh, such a good segue into what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, I'm today I'm going to be talking about making three critical points, which I think is absolutely essential for us to ensure that uh, uh, solutions are people-centric, uh, and uh, a demand driven for local communities. Uh, the, the, first, the first objective being that uh, any, any development and environmental related solutions that are top down, that are supply driven, have uh, in our experience uh, not delivered the kind of impact and not been able to deliver the kind of scale that we expected. Uh, I'm, I'm talking from very strong evidence coming from an afforestation program in India. Uh, which spent close to five million dollars uh, uh, to, to uh, on plantation programs. Uh, however, uh, there's evidence today that suggests that more than sixty percent of that uh, uh, was wasted and did not deliver the kind of impact for the people, for the communities, and for the ecosystem overall. And uh, that that gets me to uh, the critical point, which is how do we actually co-design solutions uh, for people? 
accounting for local demand, accounting for local aspirations, and accounting for the social ecological needs uh, of the landscape. Uh, I work with a program called the Alliance for Reversing Ecosystem Service Threats. Uh, we are a coalition of scientific and grassroots institutions looking to build the most socio-ecologically responsible pathway to restore degraded lands in peninsular India. And uh, adopting a demand-based people-centric approach is one of the core values of the program. Uh, However, uh, I, I just spoke about uh, uh, the state exchequer losing close to three and a half million dollars uh, for not being able to design a program to suit local needs. But can public finance actually become decentralized? And in what way can public finance actually contribute and support any kind of private investment into the landscape? Uh, we actually ha have evidence from India that suggests this is possible. Um, the government of India initiated uh, a project, uh, a scheme called Manrega, uh, which is the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural uh, Employment Guarantee Program. It's a right to work program, one of the largest in the world, initiated in 2006, that assures uh, every household at least 100 days of employment uh, in a year to support their local livelihoods, to support uh, rural development and food security. Uh, the, the reason why I'm talking about uh, uh, Manrega as we know it in India is because uh, it's, it's a demand-based project. It's uh, uh, the, 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 the smallest unit of administration in India is called the Gram Panchayat or the Village Council. And it's the Village Council that decides the kind of rural development initiatives that should be taken up uh, uh, at in, in the village that can support local livelihoods can, and can support local biodiversity. About 75% uh, uh, of the program is directed towards natural resource management. Um, and more importantly, by law, about one third of the employment uh, must be guaranteed to women. Um, why this becomes extremely critical is because we have uh, uh, evidence from the pandemic years of 2020 uh, uh, and 21, where the financial outlay for Manrega was almost tripled because of the local demand that was generated. Uh, there is enough evidence that suggests when Manrega is converged with some of the ecological restoration programs uh, locally, it, it delivers not only biodiversity as well as a livelihood benefits to the people, but also ensures uh, uh, that the landscape is sustainably managed. Uh, what we're trying to do is help redesign uh, uh, some of uh, the plenty uh, Government of India schemes around restoration to converge with Manrega in a way that these programs actually deliver to the local needs of the people that deliver to the local aspirations of the people. Um, there are about 25 schemes of the government of India, each with the component to restore degraded lands. However, much of that money remains unspent uh, purely because uh, of lack of capacity or uh, because of lack of knowledge on the potential to converge with other programs at multiple scales. And that's what we get to the table. We support the government as well as with the local communities uh, to be able to co-design uh, uh, local projects that can redirect uh, public finance, complement private investment to support the restoration aspirations um, uh, of the people locally. Uh, finally, coming to uh, the last point and why I feel public finance can be a, a, a great gap arrangement to be able to meet the landscape uh, uh, aspirations of the people is because we estimate for, uh, we, we estimate uh, 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 about six years to be the transition period uh, between uh, uh, restoring degraded landscapes. And for this transition period of a minimum of six years, uh, transition finance is extremely critical, uh, especially for smallholder farmers, especially for the landless. How do you support them financially uh, to be able to make that transition for the landscape from a state of degradation to a state of restoration? Um, well, the numbers are not very astonishing for us. Uh, we did an estimate 
uh, if we were to restore about 12 million hectares of land in peninsular India, the transition finance cost was close to $31 billion for a period of six years. That roughly translates to about $5 billion a year and close to rupees $600 uh, dollars per year per hectare. Um, the Mandrega program already provides close to two and a half to $3 billion um, a worth of investments into restoration projects. Uh, is there a way for us to be able to co-design private investment with public finance uh, for multiple sandboxes in peninsular India uh, and do it with the local communities? And those are the kind of sandboxes that we attempt to set up over the next six years in peninsular India. Uh, to be able to uh, restore degraded landscapes, uh, but in also ensuring that the decision-making for such landscapes are inclusive, it's people-centric and accountable for local aspirations. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Karishma. And uh, six years sounds aggressive. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you are very successful with that. So um, Mal, you're up next. Hello, hello everyone. Um, I hope you can see me clearly. Indeed. So from Uganda to India, and I'm taking you back to, um, to you know, the tip of Africa in South Africa, even though I'm right now sitting in a hotel room in Monrovia, Liberia. So the focus of my talk really is going to be around how do we have the right institutional arrangements that are required to channel financing to the landscape level. Uh, and this is partly because of the challenge of ensuring, like everyone has spoken about, how do we actually ensure that those investments are located at the right level, at the landscape level, and they meet the required needs of those who are on the ground. As you're probably aware, South Africa is a middle income uh, country. and um, so there's quite a bit of potential uh, public and private domestic investments that could potentially be able to address some of the landscape challenges on the ground. And we're finding that over the years, there's quite a bit of interest in investing on you know, landscape type, type innovations. But one of the biggest challenges that uh, the country experiences is, is a couple of things. One is the lack of pipeline. So there's quite a bit of actors in the landscape who would actually like to invest in new green type innovations that build resilience at the landscape level, but the project pipeline is extremely poor. So you're having this money that is sitting at a higher level. It's not actually trickling down to the landscape, uh, to the landscape level. And that's partly because also the institutions that are charged with delivering this climate finance or this investments at the landscape level oftentimes do not have traction on the ground. So you have what calls for potential you know, investments, but oftentimes uh, when the calls come through, there's actually not enough of those um, actors who are from these landscapes who apply for these investments. So how do we actually ensure that, first of all, you understand where those resources are and how do we build the intermediary institutions that are required to deliver these investments at the landscape level. And here we're talking about institutions that are located at the landscape level who understand those um, challenges and are able to build um, the kind of pipeline that could potentially draw investments. And one of the challenges I found in South Africa in relation to ensuring that investments flow to the landscape is that even though the country has very strong policies, good strategies and so on, at the landscape level, oftentimes there's no, if you like, unified vision, landscape vision that identify those needs at the landscape level to be able to channel those investments. So a typical landscape, you'll find these various actors. Um, it could be you know, the private sector who focus more on productivity issues and oftentimes are located upstream of a particular landscape if you're looking, for example, at agribusiness type actors, and within those uh, landscapes, you also obviously have the, the interests of those who are trying to protect public goods, whether it's communities that are deriving their livelihoods out of um, this, this lands, this, these landscapes, government that wants to protect important water source areas and so on. But there's no unified 
vision for that particular landscape that would allow all these different actors to optimally utilize, um, if you like, the existing, to optimize on the investments that could be able to drive that landscape landscape vision. And, and, and we believe that to be able to achieve that, you need the right institutions that are on the ground. So South Africa, for example, has two um, uh, climate finance accredited institutions who has been charged with the responsibility of essentially tapping into international public finance to address you know, climate change related issues. But they are bogged down by this poor pipeline of, um, of potential projects to, 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 to invest in. And so what we're saying is, in the landscape that we're working in is that can we build the capacity of intermediary institutions that would become essential as conduit for this climate finance. And that would un- enable this finance to be able to flow down onto, on, 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 onto the ground. And that essentially requires innovative ways of how um, this pipeline could, could, be, could, be, could, could be developed. For a place like South Africa that has got a very strong um, private sector presence, the real opportunity lies in developing landscape green enterprises with viable business models that could tap into some of these resources. And um, for those of you who have been in this um, climate finance or business development landscape, it's not easy to, uh, to, to develop enterprises on the ground. And that's partly because of some of the challenges in developing a strong business case for a landscape. So for mitigation type projects, it's easier, you know, but if you're looking at adaptation projects, oftentimes the time, the time horizons are, are very, very long, it's difficult to un- unlock some of those um, investments. And in many cases, a lot of the business models have not really been tested. So you're grappling with a challenge of how do you support entrepreneurs at the landscape level in a way that uh, you could undertake radical experimentation while ensuring that those uh, entrepreneurs actually tap into those potential resources that are that are available at, at, a, at a much more broader bro, broader um, sorry bro, at, a, at a much more broader uh, le- level and so for me I think that the lack of intermediate institutions is the kind of challenge that we would like we, we work on with various partners in the in, in, in the country, and we're starting to see some progress in terms of, um, you know, uh, more patient capital starting to flow into these landscapes because there's a recognition that you can't actually, you know, uh, get your return on investment until you start experimenting, until you tr- start trying on new, um, um, uh, if you like, innovations. And some of the things we're doing there is, for example, working with development banks, and this is not only in South Africa, but in the entire region to try to build their capacity around ca- climate finance. Because the issue of capacity is not just at the landscape level. It, it also sits at the high level where capital essentially sits. Because most of these financial institutions have been built as traditional financial institutions. So the issues around climate finance are still emerging. So you, you require capacity development at these various levels. At the development bank level, and at the landscape level where these actors are actually uh, are actually operating. And what that does is that it allows you to develop a narrative right from the landscape level of how do you actually make a strong business case at the landscape level that would allow you to, um, to be able to tap these financial resources that oftentimes sit at a national level or at a regional level, even globally. So for me, I think that that's really a key issue in terms of making sure that the right institutions are in place, making sure that those institu- institutions are capacitated, and thirdly, building the pipeline of projects that would allow you know, landscape entrepreneurs or businesses to be able to tap into this investment and therefore unlock opportunity at the landscape level. I would like to stop here. I don't know if I've gone past my time or not, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I, I wouldn't worry about I wouldn't worry about that at all, Malva. Thank you very much. And so, so we've just heard from three experts in different parts of the world about the importance of 
channeling money and power and knowledge to these local communities because they'll know better what to do than people in you know, major cities around the world or major international NGOs and the like. And so I come to this um, as a technologist and uh, was invited by Sarah, Sarah Shear to join A Thousand Landscapes to bring sort of the Silicon Valley tech perspective, but not the Silicon Valley data and business models, because uh, as I think I'm going to highlight in my talk, uh, that's often about disempowering local communities, about extracting data from them. So just a brief part about, so our role is to build sort of the open source tech infrastructure for local landscapes at these lo local areas that bring the same kind of technology and power that, that modern multinationals would have available to them. And so we are partnered through a thousand landscapes with a dozen landscapes around the world who are actually telling us what they need, what questions they have about their place, what kind of funding they would like to find to do what kind of things they would like to do. And our job is to provide them the tools to do that. So, so right now we're in the middle of this, this project in partnership with Thousand Landscapes of building that tech platform. It's called Terrasso. And right now those dozen landscapes are, are testing our, our early versions of this software. And our long-term goal, of course, is to be a key part of the technical infrastructure that unlocks this potential, that unlocks what the power of data and knowledge and, and unlocks the funding that I think we've, we're focusing on today. So, so with this common theme that we've been talking about of, of channeling power to local communities, um, you know, I think that we're finding out that they have something personal at stake. They live in this place. They understand what works and what doesn't work. They understand the politics. They understand the business models that are actually conceivable, the products they might actually be able to sell. And so as a tech person who deeply believes in the power of software and data to do good, I was stunned when I did my very first interview um, exploring sort of the local user perspective on what technology could do for them. My, my very first conversation was at a conference called the African Landscape Dialogues in Tanzania. And that's actually where I, I got to meet Mao for the first time. Um, and so, but the first interview that, that we did um, was with a with the local leader named Kamau Mbogo. And he's the head of Imarisha Naivasha, which is a, a, a regional sort of multi-stakeholder group around the Lake Naivasha landscape, the Ni Lake Naivasha region in, in Kenya. And so, um, so I was like, great, tell me all about how technology is helping you. And one of the first points he made was, hey, you know, I represent the local stakeholders, you know, the, the horticulture industry that's growing flowers and the, and the herding communities and the, and the major town and the, the smallholder farmers. And so we make all the decisions and we have none of the data about our place. Our place is one of the best studied ecosystems in the Rift Valley, and we don't have access to any of that data. So, so we're flying blind when it comes to actually making decisions about our place. We know that we know the data exists. Um, we, we just don't have it. It's locked up at this university or at the national government or this big NGO or it's in the supply chain or it's in the financial sector, but we don't have it. And he said, that's called data colonialism. Now, I had never heard that term, but it did not sound like a good one. Um, and so I started doing some research into data colonialism and I found out that this is a very familiar concept to indigenous communities around the world. The idea that people come and extract knowledge from them and privatize that knowledge and benefit from it and the local communities don't, don't benefit from that at all. So I, I also talked to some of my peer social leaders and, uh, and one of the most deep conversations I had was with Mithya Ramanathan of Nextleaf Analytics. So she's one of the key uh, players in the global vaccine cold chain and, and, and helps gather that data. And she said, oh yeah, data colonialism is rampant in the public health and global health sectors where, where people extract data from, from countries uh, and then write reports and the local health ministry hasn't even heard about this data until it's presented in an international meeting. So, so anyway, I interviewed Nithya at last year's Skull World Forum and the reaction was so strong that we, we wrote an article together with a couple of our colleagues called Decolonized Data. It's in the latest issue of Stanford Social Innovation Review and it talks about some of these problems, you know, how, how extracting data from a local community and not making that data available, that disempowers the local community. Um, it encourages low quality decision-making. If you don't know what's going on, what's working, what's not working, then how do you make better decisions about your programs? And it mis 
appropriates resources, right? It actually extracts resources to the benefit of other organizations and not just for-profit organizations. You know, often nonprofit organizations or academics. Um, and in worst cases, with, with some of our um, impact-related finance, you can be punished. Punished with data that you had no idea was collected, had no ability to correct, no ability to provide context, and no ability to appeal. Now, today, we're not just talking about bad things that are happening, and we're talking about how do we actually solve these problems. And so, so uh, as part of this article, Nithya and I laid out a few of our recommendations about how to use data in a less colonial fashion, how to decolonize data. And first of all, um, we, we came up with, well, four principles, but our first principle was data should be owned by the community actors, not other people. Right, the, 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 they're the rightful data owners. The data is being collected about them and their place. And the rightful data owners should decide what should remain private. And this isn't just personally identifiable information about individuals. It's also, if you're an indigenous community, you might not wanna publicize the location of your uh, most sacred artifacts or natural resources that happen to be on your land because you don't want people to come in illegally and take it away from you. Um, data should only be shared with meaningful consent for, you know, for meaningful benefits. In other words, how, how is this data actually going to help us? I think there are many, many communities around the world and many individual smallholder farmers who would be fine with sharing their data if it benefited their larger community and didn't get used in a way that hurt them. Right? People are very communitarian in this, but because the past experience has been quite negative, they, they're maybe a little bit less inclined to share their data. Um, and, and lastly, data should not be punitive. And I mean, as, as a data scientist, where I see data as the power to learn and to be better and to continuously improve, if, if certain data results end up with you being punished, that creates a deep incentive to provide data that does not punish you. That's called low quality data because data that's been cooked to address a incentive structure um, is less useful for learning because it doesn't actually re represent what's actually going on. So, so our goal um, is that through, you know, through a thousand landscapes, which has multiple pillars, right? One pillar is local capacity development and, and providing access to how other people have solved similar problems. Um, there's also a financial element. How can we channel the funding to these local communities and actually enable them to understand how to tap climate finance, how to access these larger financial flows in ways that make sense to them. And then lastly, we're the, we're the tech portion of this where hopefully these tech tools are available enable people to make better decisions, run better programs, collect the data that will hopefully enable them to unlock some of this climate-related finance, to have the impact data that they control rather than third parties control, that help them chart a better course for their community to the benefit of not only their local community, but we think, you know, global society and the planet as a whole. So those are the ends of our, of our initial remarks. We're at about the halfway point, which was our plan. So that's going well. Um, we're about to break into small group sessions. Um, and so, uh, and, and we'll be trying to make these small group sessions, you know, dynamic. We're trying to seed them with, you know, one of the, one of the speakers. Um, and so, and then after a, a 15, 16 minute small group session, um, we'll come back into plenary and I'll be turning things over to Sarah to kind of lead final conversations with each of our speakers. Uh, she's also going to be working from the Google Doc uh, that I think is has just been posted in the chat. And each group will have its own sort of session. So, you know, room one, room two, room three, you know, put in, put in, you know, who is there. Uh, you guys should obviously introduce yourselves, but try to keep that to, you know, under, under a minute each so that you actually have some time. And I know that the people who have actually joined this session have, have also, like our speakers, come up with ways to solve these problems. It would be great to hear, certainly in your small groups, how that was, but also add that to the Google Doc so that we can share it more widely. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah um, to kind of, uh, you know, identify some of the questions that you think are burning and channel some of those to our uh, three speakers. And you need to unmute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to look through the Google Docs um, and see some of the issues that 
that came up in the group that I was in. It was very interesting for me because it was 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 involved with um with, with Mark Mark Drain in particular, uh, who we were comparing the experience in some of these urban and health centered uh, climate discourses and initiatives with the, the more rural ones, which has been extremely interesting for me uh, to look at the potential cross fertilization between those those communities. Um, what I'd like to do is a number of things I think have come up. I, what I'd like to do uh, is to go back to our speakers uh, for a minute to get their reflections on what some of the issues that came out of your small groups and 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 areas where you think we really need to drill in further. What do you think is the next steps of what we need to do? So let me just ask you those two questions. What came up for you from the discussion or the chat or the questions you've heard uh, that you'd like to respond to now? Uh, and secondly, what, what, what do we need to do in the next five years? What, what needs to happen? Um, and maybe I'll go back here to, to Pauline. And just just take two minutes or so. Okay. Um, in in the I think that for me, well, I want to first and foremost uh, start from uh, the discussion in my group that was about was around uh, technology and about data. Um, I hope you can hear me. There is some yeah. sort of strange noise. I don't know, but it, I, don't worry I about think, it. It's I think coming through. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so is it is it okay now? Okay, so yeah. I, I yeah I I just want to to um to to, to just start from uh, where we were in my in my group where people were where there was a discussion on uh, on technology and um, and and how uh, the sharing of data and uh, what's happening. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think that it's it's nightfall here, and uh, but I don't know what has just happened because I I look like a ghost. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> not to worry. <laughs> so yes, so the, the the use of of technology and maybe where we would like to go, how information that has been collected by other people can be accessed by other people so that there are no there are no repetitions or duplication because. Financing is invested in getting that technology, and that technology is basically supposed to be uh, for for accessible, so that it improves on how uh, financing is delivered in the in the in in the landscapes. And and I shared our example where technology can actually make the difference between uh, not being able to access and being able to access but also scalability. And, and I think that we need to bring many people on board. We need to have partnerships. Like our partnership was between us as a civil society organization and one of the SMS media companies in Uganda that we finally worked, it, worked out. Although when it outgrew, when our needs outgrew that particular relationship, we were able to access another technology somewhere else. Sometimes we as uh, project developers, you don't even know the functionalities of a technology that you're looking for. But when you go into partnerships with a, a, a company that is also willing to explore and meet the needs of, of the landscape, then you're able to figure out what it is. So I imagine if we had gone straight away to a commercial company to request for services, we would never have been able to even uh, work out the terms of reference, to even work out the, the specifications of what we were looking for. But because we had already experimented with, albeit a not so experienced tech, tech company, we were able to, to work out the scope of what it is that, um, that we were looking for. So I would like to, to, to end, I think, by encouraging uh, so many of these um, partnerships where the, the technologies, the technology developers can work with uh, community engagement partners so that we can bring the different uh, expertise and, and value proposition that we all we can all bring it to the table so that we can come up with uh, with uh, workable uh, solutions. Uh, thank you.
Thank you very much, Pauline. I'm sure Jim and his team are very happy to hear what you're, uh, you're having to say there. Um, let me turn over then uh, to uh, Karishma. Karishma, any, any thoughts that came up from your, from your discussions that you'd like to follow up with? Uh, yes, I, I, uh, I think the point made by Carol was uh, uh, something that we uh, uh, acknowledge but uh, often ignore uh, when we talk of community stakeholder consultations uh, at the grassroots. Uh, and the point was that sometimes the grass top leaders are not wholly representative of the people. Uh, and this is mainly because uh, uh, we sort of see communities to be homogeneous groups. And uh, uh, therefore, the critical point for us to keep reinforcing as, as we co-design some of the solutions with communities is not to see communities as homogeneous groups. Uh, uh, these are as diverse uh, 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 as they can be, accounting for multiple castes and classes, uh, including marginalized and uh, marginalized communities uh, 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 in India, uh, specifically those of the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, um, whose um, uh, the kind of challenges and the kind of historical oppression and injustices that they have faced uh, really defines their relationship to the landscape. And that needs to be accounted for uh, uh, when we speak about co-designing some of those solutions. Um, uh, I think for me, over the next five to six years, uh, something that uh, will take center stage is uh, how do we ensure that we don't adopt a cookie cutter approach to multiple landscapes? Uh, uh, how do we sort of uh, 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 set the narrative that each landscape, each context uh, uh, differs uh, in multiple ways? And therefore what, what may work in central India may actually not work in Northern India and what works in Northern India is not gonna work in Southern India. In fact, I think even when I say Northern India and central India, I'm, I'm generalizing. What basically works in, in a sub-region uh, uh, in one of the states in India may not work in another state. And therefore, how do we sort of, uh, uh, how, how do we build uh, uh, that differentiation and that variety uh, when it comes to looking at landscape restoration at scale, uh, when looking at uh, uh, solutions uh, uh, that work for the people, uh, that work for the social ecological landscapes that we are working in, and uh, therefore then, uh, uh, what are uh, uh, what what is the approach that we can take in terms of uh, uh, supporting local institutions uh, 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 in in make in supporting local institutions to take decisions. Um, uh, that are more cognizant of the social ecologically complex landscapes that they're working in. I think those are some of the challenges that we definitely see going forward uh, uh, with uh, scaling up restoration across multiple landscapes. In India. Now that's, that's extremely interesting, Karishma. It's a challenge that we're seeing for the whole 1000 landscape for 1 billion people initiative, because we're seeing that every single landscape is so unique but it still has so much to learn from what other landscape groups have done. They need to be adapted to the local context, but we are finding that, that we're seeing much of the same issues and challenges across all landscapes, even though their particulars are quite, quite, quite different. Um, and, and I think that also applies to finance. The financial institutions really want to have standardized models their, their, their approach has been standardized models that can be very, very widely applicable. How do we balance the need for, for, for standardization to the need for application for very unique circumstances? And I think we can do it. We're seeing a lot of interesting ways that that could be done, but a lot of it has to do with the building of, 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 of local institutions, as you mentioned. And I think that's also a, a point that, that Mal made in his own talk. I'm wondering after these further discussions, Mal, if there's some other reflections you've had from the small groups or the chat uh, and what you would see the top priorities in the next five years for, for moving forward in this challenge of finance would be. I think just like, I think Sarah, uh, and thanks everyone else, I think just like uh, Pauline's group, we focus more on data and how do we, how to decolonize data. Uh, uh, because we realize that uh, it's not really just about um, how that data is used, but it's also how do we actually collect that data? 
Because oftentimes the reason why the data is not actually finding any local resonance is because it's not being mainstreamed at that level. So the data that is collected, you're coming from elsewhere to collect that data to serve your own purpose, but it's not actually um, embedded in the local needs and if, through effective participation of local actors, whether it's through ensuring that the language that, um, uh, that, that is used to collect that data actually is appropriate language, uh, whether that data is using the right channels to, you know, um, uh, feed into in other bigger pictures that are available. Because obviously, is that sometimes you might be collecting data, let's say, for a much more bigger, let's say, global purpose. And so how do you ensure that this data integrates so that you can have that, if you like, landscape scale view? Um, and we thought that maybe, you know, through the use of innovation such as artificial intelligence, and, and the idea of big data, you might be able to, you know, overcome some of these uh, constraints in terms of um, uh, ensuring that the right data can be collected. But also in, in our group, really, I gave an example for where, for example, um, the use of um, citizen science. And I, I gave an example in South Africa where actually local communities uh, you know, participate in data collection on water quality, you know, something that traditionally would have been seen as complex and so on. But by simplifying some of those tools, you actually uh, bring uh, understanding at the community level on the kind of systemic challenges that, that, that they face. But also you empower them by, ens by ensuring that they actually feel like they can make a contribution to solving the problem. So, so the issue of data for me, it's, it's very, very critical. And from a finance perspective, we're seeing one of the biggest challenge in South Africa, for example, is the inability to track uh, climate finance, for example, because that data is sitting all over the place. So we don't even know how much climate finance is trickling into the country, uh, how much local or even international domestic, uh, domestic and international climate finance is. And if you don't know how much you actually have as a resource, where is that resource being deployed? And so you wouldn't be able to match the needs to the opportunities. So for me, I think that I'm looking forward uh, this issue around better deployment of data. I think it's going to be very critical. Um, and I don't see any other way of how we collect effective data without a much more bottom down, up, bottom up approach by deploying you know, the right type of tools and so on at the landscape level. But more importantly, and I think the challenge to Jim is how do you build the technology integrations that are required where you actually able to collect this data at a very, very fine scale and how do you integrate that at the different scale at the landscape level, at the national level, at the, and even global level. So that issue around data integration, I think becomes really important. But I'm very optimistic that uh, with all these technology developments that we have around, we should be able to unlock some of those um, challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, let me pass it over to Jim because uh, you, you obviously heard a few things today. What uh, some, some, some key reflections that come up for you, things you think we should be working on in a thousand landscapes in this next uh, bit of time? Well, I, I think there's some real themes here, right? And I think, I think that, um, and, and the themes show up in different ways, right? So. So one theme is the interest of the individual farmer or even the woman in a farming couple may not all be aligned with the village interests or the supply chain interest or the co-ops interest. And, and we, in some ways, by building these tools that are trying to reach people at the, at the local landscape level, have to keep in mind that there are power dynamics inside these communities. They're not monolithic in their approach. And so how do you design technology for that? It turns out that there are ways to do this. And you know, right now, you know, there are far, you know, tools being built for farmers in the United States, might be useful in other countries. How do, how do we use that? And then how do we use the data of a farmer, an individual farmer in a way that advances that farmer's interest but contributes to these larger interests. For example, if you share this data about how you grew this stuff organically, you'll be paid a premium, might create that kind of incentive that a farmer wants. So, so that's at this very local level and we're, we're dealing with this. And there are ways of handling data so that it benefits the larger sort of context without actually handing over 
an individual farmer's data or their production data or sharing the, their production data with the tax authorities because perhaps they're making twice as much money as they've told the tax authorities, whatever it might be. The, the, other, the other theme that, um, that I think is, is, is showing up and, and it's, it's shown up already with sort of the application of geospatial data to trees. It turns out that not every community trees are the same as they are in Europe or the United States or, or even in you know, Latin America. It turns out that, that context matters and that even though we might have the same data about a place from a set of satellites, how it actually works on the ground is quite different. And, and we see this linkage between relatively modest amount of data collected at the local level, hopefully under control of the local community, unlocks the value of these massive amounts of data. And it's that combination that gets interesting. And we wanna make sure that, that it's not uh, solely approached as international organizations or, or national agencies you know, have all that power of, of integrating that data, that, that that power actually devolves and can actually be used. And so mass customization is, 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 is a known term, is how do we make these common tools that are useful, general sort of recipes for doing things, but then you know every every place makes bread differently. How do we actually create the infrastructure so it's very easy to make bread to your local specifications, and, and yet you can make more of it or cheaper or whatever it might be. So so that's that's the dynamic that is that is striking me is these power dynamics at the local level and sort of this mass customization need to actually get people useful tools that work in the local context rather than saying this is the standard maze model and it's going to work globally because it's not. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. And I think it's, I'm quite struck as you were speaking by, I think you were referring particularly to data and technology, mm -hmm. but I actually think the very same thing is true of finance. Uh, because we've been working on this idea of sort of widely replicable models, the only way we can get a billion dollars worth of new landscape restoration is if we have one specific mechanism for doing that work on the ground and then we just replicate it across millions of people. That is, that's not the model that's going to work. It's very clear. Um, but the financial system itself needs to be adjusting. And I was really quite inspired by the examples from, uh, from Atri in, in, in India about the way that they were de designing this rural employment, which was originated for something very different in some ways, uh, which has evolved to be a much more sophisticated um, instrument uh, to deliver financing and to start new kinds of financial partnerships. And really interested uh, also in the case of, of Uganda uh, with this, this system of having locally led landscape plans that then devolve into very individualized plans at the farm level and that these big pools of climate finance, these carbon offset funds, are then able to be deployed to help the farmers of the local. But I think we need to look at how these are put together, because I think these are very models that can be operated at scale, but not by doing exactly the same thing everywhere. And I think this is something that financial actors can, once you get them involved and they get interested in it, they're pretty creative too. They know how to create specific financial instruments. They need to understand what it's for and who needs to be uh, involved. So, um, so I think there's some real opportunities there. And if we had a lot more time, I'd love to get more into sort of what are the those local institutions, what do they need to look like? It's local institutional development is something that's grossly underfunded. And when it is funded, it's funded at a short-term level where we're really talking about long-term institutions it's as though we were trying to fund our public school system on the basis of two-year funding <laughs> projects or three-year funding projects. These are long-term issues that are going to grow even more important as we all start tackling more extensively climate change adaptation. Adaptation is not something you do once. It's something that we need to be regularly modifying at the landscape territorial level uh, what are our economic development strategies? What are our land management strategies? How are we going to adjust our markets? How are we going to adjust? So you need that platform for groups to be able to continue working together and to have support for those kinds of institutions. So um, I think that's all I have time to say right now myself. Uh, let me pass it over to Jim to wrap us up. Yes. Well, and I think I think in I was going to make the uh, the effort to 
to synthesize what we've just heard. But I think, Sarah, you just did that. And so, so I think I just want to thank um, our speakers, uh, Pauline, Karishma, Mao, and of course, Sarah for helping organize this, our, our teams. Um, for helping us you know, get this session going. And of course, this will be recorded and we'll be putting it out on YouTube. Um, I wanna thank all the attendees for engaging, for being interested in this topic, um, for being part of the, the Skull World Forum this year. And, uh, and I think that we've kind of highlighted the importance of local action, landscape level action, and shifting power and money to these local communities. And I think that we are all committed to making that happen. And it was great to be part of a community that shares that goal. So thank you very much for being part of this today. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks everyone else for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, okay, bye. Take care. Bye everyone, and thanks to the Skull Foundation as well for organizing this great forum.